the most important difference across individuals in explaining how happy they were with their lives. Lots of things were important, but marginally, the most important one was trust in the place where they worked. So, and it was mm. a big effect, so that to work in a workplace where trust in management is one point higher on a 10-point scale, that's not a really big deal, it happens all the time between workplaces, was the equivalent to the life satisfaction of people who worked there to a one-third change in income. Mm. Now that's quite a precise wow. estimate. It's precise because we can identify the effects of income, but we can also identify the effects of these other things, and they're stronger and bigger. But if you ask someone, which <laughs> I'm just thinking, if you ask most people, what would, what would make you happier? A, a raise in pay or a little more trust of your boss? <laughs> I think most people would say a raise in pay. Well, that's why they need to see the results. <laughs> they need, and they need to think about them. So I was doing this on a radio program, and they had a call in. Oh, uh, uh, one intermediate point I have to make is <coughs> there's a big gender difference on this. Mm. Women are twice, place twice the value on workplace trust in terms of money that men do. They care about the income less, and they care about the workplace trust more. And what's more, they vote with their feet. So on average, uh, women are in higher trust workplaces than men are matters more to them, and they're smart enough to figure it out and go there. So there was then a call-in segment of this uh, uh, program, and the, 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 the host said, call in, tell us, does it make any sense or not? Several women called in, and they said, you bet it did. And it's pretty obvious when you've lived it. I said, think about being in a low-trust workplace. That's a workplace where there's somebody watching over your shoulder, and you're checking in and checking out, clocking in and clocking out, rules-driven, right? High-trust workplace, we're all in this together. We know what each person is doing. Do your job, get it done, and that's it, because it's mutual trust. Well, she said, think about being uh, a mother. because It turns out the mothers end up carrying the can more than fathers in most of these two-worker households. So they end up having to be the person that actually has to try and match a job with the thing. Mm. Well, if you're in, she said, if I'm in, I've had both kinds of jobs. In the high-trust workplace, it was never a deal. I just did it and told my boss. I did my work at home or somewhere. It, the work was done, but it just made life a lot more fun. I could make a complicated life work in a way I couldn't if the trust weren't there. It's interesting because in some ways the pursuit of more money takes us away from the kinds of things that would actually make us happy. Yes, and there's an extra twist. There's a, a lot of psychology done by cognitive psychologists who look at the kind of mistakes people make for reasons I don't think we fully understand yet. People overestimate the happiness they're going to get from more goods and services, and they underestimate the happiness they'll get from more social connections. Mm -hmm. So they routinely make mistakes and uh, find themselves with a longer commute and less time at home uh, for a little bit more money in a bigger house. So tell me more about trust. You've uh, mentioned it in the workplace. Um, what about in neighborhoods? What, what about other places? Where, what do the, we know the, about The that? classic trust question that was asked in the social capital literature early on has been asked since the 1950s in some surveys, and that's why we use it. As, in general, do you think people can be trusted? or alternatively, you can't be too careful in dealing with people. And uh, this turned out to be very important, but that then led some skeptics to say, oh, that's just a waffly question. How on earth would you know how to answer that or what people mean when they answer it? Uh, and uh, others to say, how do you unpack it? So when we set up a subsequent lot of surveys, we thought of ways of unpacking it. One way was to have a question that mimicked a Reader's Digest experiment that they ran about 20 years ago now, where they drop wallets in 10 cities around the world and in 10 cities in the United States, 10 wallets each, I think, and said how many of them were returned. It turned out in Helsinki, remember Helsinki, one of the top four? In Helsinki, all 10 wallets were returned. In other cities, much smaller numbers. So we said, okay, let's ask a question like that. So we had a question that was first asked in Canada and then the Gallup poll picked it up for the world for a while. And then they ran into some country where people didn't carry wallets, so they ran. <laughs> <laughs> so they gave up. Uh, well, okay, what do you do if you don't have a wallet? <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> anyway, you'd think you'd be able to solve that problem. Everybody knows how to define something that matters to people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we asked a question, if you dropped a wallet with lost a wallet with $200 in it, how likely is it to be returned if it was found by a neighbor 
a police officer, a stranger, or a clerk in a local store? And then the answers all came back and so on. And when we asked them around the world, of course, the ranking of police and neighbors varied <laughs> according to the country. <laughs> as you might imagine. But it turns out all of these dimensions of trust were important to life satisfaction, all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, fortunately, someone else came along to run another wallet experiment without really knowing about the research, but they did it anyway because it was fun. The Toronto <laughs> Star dropped 20 wallets in Toronto in downtown Toronto. Well, of course, in the meantime, we convinced the Statistics Canada to put these wallet questions in the general social survey. Oh. So we knew from very large samples of people in Toronto how likely people th thought it was that their wallet would be returned if found by a stranger. So the answer was 24% of the people, in, I mean, 24% likelihood of the wallet being returned, averaging across all these people. Tiny margin of error across the people. Well, how many of the 20 wallets do you think were returned? In Toronto, how many do you think? 20, 20 people are saying. 25. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yes. you can't say 25. <laughs> 16. Wow. So what does that tell you? Well, the happiness that people have is from living in a community where they trust other people. Well, where we, what we have there is evidence that people don't believe that other mm -hmm. people can be trusted. Now, to some extent they do, but people are much more trustworthy than they're giving than credit they for being. Well, yeah. well that's You're, shooting ourselves in the foot to believe that trust levels are lower than they actually are. I mean, you can say, to go around saying, being a Pollyanna and say, oh, everyone's trustworthy, might be a little foolish if you ended up with a, something bad happening. But we're so far from that. Yeah. Here, our neighbors, in a, even, a, even a big, fast-moving city like Toronto, where the wallet return is almost bound to be less than it is in, uh, in places where people really do know whose wallet it is, is way higher than people believe it is. So it wouldn't take much to convince us, it shouldn't take much to convince us, that those actual wallet returns are the world, and their opinions are just wrong. Yeah. And once they start changing their opinions, then they're going to reach out much more readily to other people.